Now, anti-government demonstrations uh, in Syria's southern province of Sueda have now entered their fourth week. The peaceful protests are a show of civil disobedience in a province largely populated by people from the Druze religious minority. The demonstrations were sparked by economic measures enacted by President Bashar al-Assad. Now protesters say they will not stop gathering on Sueda's al-Karama Square until they overthrow the regime. Non-stop protests, day and night. Civil disobedience like this, aimed at President Bashar al-Assad in a government-controlled province, is a rare sight. The people want to bring down the regime. People made it here to Karama Square, Dignity Square, to demand freedom. Most people who live here belong to the Druze community. Up to now, they have been relatively neutral in the war. But a recent decision by the president pushed hundreds onto the streets. Assad doubled public wages and then lifted fuel subsidies, leading to a three-fold price increase. Initially, the demands had to do with living conditions. The protests soon swelled, drawing thousands of demonstrators calling for an end to the Assad regime. This regime does not even have anything it can offer people. The bills it paid to Iran and Russia in return for their military assistance destroyed the wealth of all of Syria's population. The regime stole the country's resources and didn't even leave 10 per cent to the people to live in dignity as human beings. In 2011, the slogan now being chanted by protesters in Sueda was heard in several cities. Assad responded to those demonstrations with brutal force, punishing dissent with disappearances, imprisonment and torture. But despite the risks involved, thousands, including women and children, are again voicing their opposition. Look at what happened to Sueda. This is what's pushing us to go down and demonstrate. We're not scared. What more is there to happen? Organizers are urging protesters to remain peaceful to prevent any escalation. Our focus now is to make Dignity Square a success, to have our voices reach the entire world from here. After destroying symbols of the Assad family's grip on power, protesters set up a camp at the square, signaling that they're here to stay. Let's bring in Syrian human rights activist Omar al shogray with the U.S.-based Syrian Emergency Task Force. Joining us today from Stockholm, Omar, thank you so much for joining us. To start, can you tell us more about the Druze community, uh, who they are, and why we're seeing them protesting now? This community, just as the rest of the Syrians, went out to the street asking for their basic rights. And the Syrian regime, after 12 years of war, have destroyed the resources of the country, destroyed every factory you could imagine, destroyed every possibility for people to generate some income. The trigger of, of their race to the street is the economic um, you know, crisis. However, the main reasons is um, the widespread corruption in all state institutions and from the presidency to the smallest governor um, department. Um, mm. You know, the regime has uh, a combination, you receive the combination of aid um, of, from a military aid to oil and cash from Iran, and now the regime has to pay back. And this money is coming from the, re the, the, the money that will be paid back to this regime is going to come from the, from the backs of the Syrian people, from their resources, from their life. So they pay the highest cost. However, what people asking on the street is for the change of the regime that does not only steal their wealth and resources, this regime has arrested, tortured, and killed, displaced so many of these people in both in Sueda, in Dara, in the north, and in the middle of the country. Yeah, and how significant is it that we are now seeing what is a relatively small minority group becoming so vocal? Do you think that these protests are going to have a wider influence on uh, reigniting the opposition? These protests are, are very special, considering the fact that the, the strongest lie that the Syrian regime has been relying on has been protecting minorities. 
Uh, and Durs are one of these minorities. And now when they all of them are on the street under a, a united leadership of the Durs community, because they are a small minority, they are united. And because of that, they are outside of the regime, outside of the regime control and protesting the regime that the regime cannot just go f bombing them with airplanes and with barrel bombs saying, hey, I'm killing terrorism because they cannot be classified by the regime as terrorists because they are Durs, they are not Sunni Muslims and they are minorities. So it's it's a weak spot for the regime. That's why it's a moment for the Syrian people to invest in it. While people in Sweden are protesting, we should all race together and bring awareness about our cause. Like we did in 2011, 2012, we have to renew it. For, for us, in my hometown, Banias, we could rise in 2011 in March and go out to the street. In Qunaitra, in, in, in Suwaida, they couldn't do that. And now they can. So we have to support them in all possible ways because they have the right demands, the demands for dignity. And they out in the dignity square for a reason. They chose that square for a reason because they asking for their dignity, for a life, for democracy, justice, and freedom could be respected. And obviously, the regime who committed so many crimes against humanity cannot provide them with that. Okay, so you think that you may not see the kind of brutality that the al-Assad regime has been willing to exert to put down protests on this particular group, if I understand you correctly. Um, how widespread is this movement? Is it just uh, on what's known as Dignity Square, or are we seeing it spread out further? It's widespread. Um, it's, you're more likely to see the Dignity Square because it's the biggest spot where you, well, the protesters are gathering. However, there are over 20 different spots where people in Sweden are protesting. And the regime is, from my assumption, from my understanding, is less likely to start with um, with uh, military violence, rather try to siege uh, Sweden to prevent any food from getting in. However, Sweden is a more of a, a agriculture um, you know, uh, town, making it, uh, e well, not easier, but difficult for the regime to break them down by um, sieging them. So if the international community does not keep talking about it and witness it and, and, and be active about and supporting Suweda, the regime will definitely interfere militarily like they did in every other city. Uh, the regime does not care about killing Alawites, Christian, Durzi, minority or majority. They don't care. But mm. if the world is paying attention, the regime is less likely to do it. Okay, a strong call. Thank you so much for joining us on DW News. That is, D that is a Syrian human rights activist, Omar al Shoge. We really appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you, Flynn. To get some more insights into these protests, we're joined now by journalist and Syria expert, Kristen Helberg. Great to see you, Kristen, and thanks for being on DW. So what's driving these protests? Well, in the beginning, it was the economic hardship, obviously, that is um, really taking the air of the people to breath because life in Syria is hell. The Syrian pound continues to collapse. Salaries are not enough. You know, you have a salary for a state employee of $10 with which you cannot feed a family. So prices are constantly rising. We had this sharp increase in fuel prices when the regime withdrew the subsidies in August. So people survive basically thanks to the humanitarian aid from the UN, which is funded by the West, it is controlled and appropriated by Assad, and by money that is being sent to them from Europe. So everybody's only thinking about leaving the country, while at the same time, corruption and mismanagement take away this uh, breath of the people, because Assad's backers are shamelessly enriching themselves. You know, they are exploiting the people wherever they can. And Assad, and this is interesting, he cannot stop them. He doesn't stop them because he depends on the forces that keep him in power, militia leaders, local warlords, businessmen. You have senior intelligence officials whose sons now control the black market, for example. So Assad has to keep these people in line by creating opportunities for them to earn money by smuggling, by uh, drug trafficking. And these structures are really like a mafia. So people are very much upset with this and they feel that it's really Assad himself who ruined the country. Now, but could these protests, though, spread to other parts of Syria? And is there then the potential that uh, we could see the regime being toppled? As long as it remains localized, there is no imminent danger for his rule, I would argue. In Sueda and as well in the in the, govern, in the neighboring province of Dada, people are allowed to a certain extent to vent their frustration. But what is important is really Assad's heartland on the coast and the big cities of the country, Damascus, Aleppo, Homs and Hama. If protests spread to these areas, 
on a larger scale, let's say, I think that intelligence agency would definitely use the proven methods to quell them. But what could pose a long-term threat to Assad is that his propaganda doesn't work any longer, even among serious minorities, because Assad has always pretended to be some kind of a protector of the minorities, but at the same time, Assad's violence is directed against anyone who challenged his power, you know, be it a Christian or a Sunni or an Alawite or a Druze. But he succeeded during these 12 years of war in binding the minorities to himself with this false narrative of protecting them from a dangerous Sunni extremist majority. So this makes it even more remarkable mm. that the frustration within these minorities is now being directed directly against the regime, hardly believes him anymore, and this could endanger him on the long term. Now, you mentioned the war there. Of course, Syria has been absolutely ravaged by that war for over a decade. Give us an idea of what impact that has had on daily life for Syrians. Well, as I said, the Syrian pound is in free fall. People don't know how to feed their families anymore. They feel that they are being pressed by the regime elite. You know, uh, you have these security guys who come along, ask you for money. You have a country full of checkpoints. Whenever you reach a checkpoint, there is a militia that asks you for money just to pass. So people really feel they cannot breathe anymore. Everybody is busy in thinking about how to leave the country. And I think the, the reaction of the regime until now is very much um, trying to keep a low profile in the South because uh, Assad himself cannot crack down on the protests there as brutally as he has elsewhere during the last few years, because otherwise he would undermine its own his own narrative as a protector of these minorities there. And mm. this could thereby de terminate the standstill agreement that he has with the Druze. And something else could or something similar could happen with the Alawite minority, of which he himself is a member of, or even with the Kurds. So I think Assad's hope in this sense is just that people don't have the strength to hold on any longer after after 12 years of war, and that these people in Sweden will just, after a certain time, go back to their houses. Thanks, Kristen. Kristen Helberg, expert on Syria.